Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. I'm Ed Crooks. I'm the US Industry and Energy Editor of the Financial Times. And we're going to be talking this morning about the quest for carbon neutrality in cities, which, of course, is an absolutely vital part of the uh, effort to tackle the threat of climate change. If you're thinking about climate, you really have to think about cities as almost as your top priority because cities account for something like 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So it is absolutely at the heart of everything we're, we're thinking about when we think about that climate issue. And of course, cities are also adding 1.5 million people every week. And so when you think about the climate problem getting worse, again, cities are a crucial um, issue there. So it's my great pleasure to welcome this um, fantastic panel to, to talk about this issue this morning. Um, on my extreme left, although I shouldn't read anything into that, but uh, we have Bill Hoffman, who's a corporate fellow and senior scientist at UL. Look at the Safety Science Company, of course. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, to his right, Jenny Scanlon, who's the president and chief executive of USG Corporation, which is, of course, the well-known uh, building materials company. To her right, um, Edward Mazria, who's the founder and chief executive of Architecture 2030, which is a non-profit that works on reducing uh, emissions and tackling climate change through uh, the built environment. And last, but by no means least, to my immediate left, we have Jenny Scanlon, who's the president, uh, sorry, <laughs> Sorry, I beg your pardon. We have James Smith. Yeah. I'm uh, reading my names out of order. Jamie Smith, who is the uh, Chief Marketing Officer at the Linux Foundation, which supports open source technology and has been looking at ways to uh, think about climate change and to tackle climate change through working on open data and the ways that data and the related technologies can help address climate. Thank you all very much indeed for coming along. Uh, Edward, I wonder if I could maybe start with you, perhaps just to kind of scope out the issue a little bit. You've been thinking about... Um, climate and cities for a long time and, and climate and the built environment for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit just about kind of what some of the key issues are as you see them and how you're thinking about the problem? Sure. Um, uh, well, in Paris, the, the agreement uh, that, uh, that the world came to was to keep global average temperature below 2 degrees Celsius and preferably at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, the reason that they came to that conclusion was because of the science, and what the science tells us is that if we go past 2 degrees C, which could happen around 2040, 2050, if we keep on the present track, um, then climate change essentially becomes irreversible and the planet actually keeps on warming because of the inertia uh, and the emissions that are in the atmosphere. So in order to stay under the 2 degrees C, we have to phase out all CO2 uh, emissions in, uh, in, the fo in fossil fuels uh, by the year 2050. We have to be on the decline right about now, the latest 2020, and then phase out um, all fossil fuel CO2 emissions by 2050. Seventy-five percent of all emissions come from cities. So uh, we know that that's where the issue is, and that's where the battle is going to be either won, uh, won or lost. Um, we also know that cities are growing exponentially. The, um, the amount of growth is, uh, is phenomenal. We're poised to add the equivalent of another planet to this planet um, in four decades, which is uh, an, an astounding uh, 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 statistic. So on, on the front lines and in cities, we know that buildings um, uh, are responsible for anywhere from two-thirds to three-quarters of all emissions coming from cities. And so, um, and that's, so, it's, so it's buildings, the majority, then transportation, then waste. Those are the three big streams of, of emissions. But buildings are obviously the, the, the huge uh, uh, emitter. Um, and, but that's mostly from building operations. And that's what, we, that's what cities count. Um, uh, if you think about all the materials that go into building another planet in four decades, it's astronomical. It's almost hard to imagine. But that's the hidden emissions that uh, cities don't deal with, but they can deal with uh, very, very uh, effectively. And we can, we, can, um, uh, we can get into that. So, um, so just to end the, the, the framework, what cities are doing now is they've all declared we're going to get the carbon neutral by 2050 or 80 by 2050. They're all going to reduce their emissions by 2050. Um, and uh, some of them have, have begun on programs. 
but most of the programs in order to get the initial reductions have been fuel switching, going from, from coal to natural gas, getting some initial reductions, and then they get stuck. Now what do we do? And we don't have the policies in place to really bend the curve down. So that's, that lays out the framework, and that's where we are today. So when you think about those objectives, then when you think about, as you say, kind of leveling off and maybe starting to decline in terms of em emissions by 2020, uh, eliminating them by 2050, the world's got a very long way to go then, you think, to, to get on that trajectory. Absolutely. Yeah. But, it, but it's doable. That's, we have all the technologies. We have the materials. Um, um, it's just now going to take uh, some inventiveness and political will. Jenny Scanlon, can I bring you in here? Can, can you talk a little bit about USG, about uh, why you take an interest in, in the climate issue and what you're doing about it? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, given the growth that Ed just described, it's a, it's a great time to be a manufacturer of building products and a really great time uh, to be a manufacturer of building products that's committed to addressing the challenge of sustainability. Um, we have been focused on sustainability, I believe, long before it was a trend. You know, we were one of the founding members of the Green Building Council. Uh, we've contributed um, to the LEED uh, uh, definitions and blueprints, and it's something that uh, USG, when we first heard about the Architecture 2030 and the goals that were put forth about a decade ago, I was in charge of corporate strategy at the time, and I was telling Ed, I remember having a conversation in a strategy meeting about how great these goals were, but was it actually realistic that we could achieve those? Because as a manufacturer, you have to uh, deliver what your customers want, and you also uh, have to make sure that it, you're doing it in an economical fashion that will benefit your shareholders. And we believe that we can play a critical role in addressing some of these challenges that Ed laid out. And in 2009, we created what we called the Eco Blueprint, which was our strategy for environmental sustainability. And our targets were to reduce our greenhouse emissions by 20% by 2020, uh, to reduce operational waste to landfills uh, by 20%, and to conduct life cycle assessments on all of our products. And we're on track to do that, but for us, the most important thing, getting back to what Ed pointed out, is it's not just uh, improving the way that we manufacture the products, and, and, but it's also creating sustainable products. And most people don't really think much about the way that drywall is made. Um, we invented sheetrock 100 years ago, and it's recycled paper on each side of mm -hmm a gypsum core, and uh, gypsum, about 50% of it, comes from the carbon emissions uh, from coal-fired power plants. That's what creates synthetic gypsum. So we're naturally reusing materials um, that otherwise would end up in, in landfills and waste. But even more importantly than that is our opportunity to extend that position. We created uh, a product and launched it last year uh, called EcoSmart, uh, sheetrock brand EcoSmart panels, we took 25% of the water out of the process. That meant that we could take 20% of the energy uh, out of drying water out of uh, our product as it goes through the kilns, and it made it lighter, so it uses 20% uh, less fossil fuels in transportation because you can put so much more product on a truck. So I view that as the trifecta of a product that's very attractive to architects that can help, uh, to Ed's point, contribute to the sustainable footprint of a building. And um, indeed, there's opportunities not just in building new buildings, but in rehabbing, repairing, and remodeling the many buildings that are out there uh, contributing to carbon emissions. And I was wondering, when you think about these kind of issues, so the kind of things you've been talking about there are very much to do with construction and refurbishment. Um, and the carbon foot footprint of your own operations and of your own products, how much do you think about buildings in operation? When you, at the point where you are um, designing and developing materials for use, are you uh, thinking about opportunities for, I mean, for instance, you know, insulation products that will uh, mean that a building might need less air conditioning, less heating, and so on, when it's actually in operation? Is that an issue for you now, or is that still kind of 
too many steps removed. No, absolutely. I think it's something that when you look at opportunities, particularly outside of the United States and the way that buildings are built, there's still this very traditional, what we call wet construction approach, you know, the, the concrete, the brick and mortar. If you shift to what we would refer to as dry construction, cavity wall, using steel framing and drywall, uh, that provides then much better opportunities for energy efficiency in the building, much tighter building envelopes, uh, much greater ability uh, in cold climates to prevent the, you know, the heat from emitting, in warm climates from using more efficient air conditioning, and in temperate climates, perhaps the opportunity to not have any air conditioning requirements at all. We think it's extremely important to shift to dry construction, not just for that reason, but when you look at the overall embodied energy going into construction, uh, it is dramatically less if you're using Western style construction practices. So it helps with the overall building operations. It also helps in the overall carbon footprint of the building going in. Right, and that shift, as you say, from wet to dry construction is still something where the world is kind of at the beginning of that transition, right? I and mean, there's still a huge opportunity there to come. It is a huge opportunity. It's something that um, we're in a joint venture in Asia, Australasia, Asia, and the Middle East, and it's something that our teams are spending a tremendous amount of time because it's beneficial um, for so many different reasons. You can, you can build uh, buildings taller, um, so addressing some of the urbanization challenge because they're lighter weight. You can build them faster, which is always beneficial to an industry that is pretty low margin and um, high financial risk. And um, at the end of the day, then there are buildings that are more energy efficient. So there's a real business case to be made for shifting from wet construction to dry construction, but it's something that we have to be out there educating uh, people that the traditional ways of doing things are not always the best for the future. And there's a sense that labor is cheap in Asia, so it doesn't matter if something takes too long or requires extra labor, but I think that as the demographics of the world are changing, that that's becoming a falsehood as well. So we've got a much better solution uh, for so many different reasons. Thank you. Um, Bill, I wonder if I could uh, bring you in here. We, we've heard both uh, Jenny and Ed talk about waste a bit, which I know is something you're very interested in. Could you t tell us a little bit about what your uh, engagement is on that issue and, and also why UL is interested and, and what it means for UL? Sure. So UL is a safety science company. We really bring uh, science and really thinking about how to best you know, bring technology into what we're doing. And that's expanded from not just safety, but also into environmental and sustainability issues, right? A broader definition of safety. Several years ago, we had someone come to us, a company, and say, look, we've seen lots of claims out there about what zero waste means. We don't know. You know, these are all very different claims. They all have different meanings. Some of them, it's not really clear what they mean, right? There's no transparency. And so they came to us and said, UL, please help us develop a standard, help us define what this means, and provide c consistency across multiple organizations making claims around zero waste. And that was the origin of our programs uh, in that space, you know, trying to bring some consistency, trying to bring some uh, transparency to what's being claimed within the marketplace. And how does it work now? Do you actually have a standard and you say, you know, this is the UL standard, and if, if you do this with your waste, then you meet the zero waste standard, and if not, not? Right, I mean, that, that's exactly right. It's all spelled out in the standard. Um, we actually have a, a, get a little bit into the detail, we have a standard nas national standards committee in the, in the US that's looking at this, and hopefully we'll have a consensus standard this year. And again, in terms of the kind of the opportunity that's out there, do you see very large opportunities for reducing waste in cities? You see, do you see large opportunities for reducing waste in cities? I mean, again, when we're thinking about all the different, you know, yeah. levers oh. you can pull, the things you can sure. do. Sure. So we've done emissions. we've done a lot of different projects with organizations, from uh, events to manufacturing sites to corporate headquarters, looking at what they're doing in terms of waste diversion. Um, it's relatively easy to get to the 80% or so range with traditional recyclables. Just paper, plastic, cardboard, you know, those kinds of things, and a lot of operations. 
when you start getting up to the 90%, it starts getting hard, 90 to 100%, that's when you start getting into the minutia of every bottle cap, every glove, every little piece of something that you have to figure out what to do with. Why do we have this and where is it going? And it really drives companies to look at all the details of what's coming into their operation and do we really need to have that? Which I guess raises the question, as you say, as it gets more difficult to get to that final 20%, um, is it worth achieving? I mean, in the sense that if there are still lot, lots of companies and lots of cities that aren't even getting to that 80%, which is relatively easy to do, perhaps that where, is that where the focus should be first? Well, there is some debate about that, depending on what your, your company, your viewpoint, how much you want to spend on it. Because when you start getting into that higher percentage, it becomes not a cost savings anymore, but a lot of times you're spending money to try to get it recycled or try to do something with it. So it depends. Um, we've seen companies that are aiming at 100% because they want to have that as a goal. They understand the other implications of that for carbon and for uh, energy use, for resource efficiency. And so they've set a broader goal to be 100%, not because of the financial reasons, but because of these other impacts that happen because of that. Thanks so much. I want to talk to, to a couple of the other panelists about sort of business cases in a moment. But actually, first, before I do that, can, Jamie Smith, can I bring you in? Can you just talk a little bit about uh, Linux uh, Foundation, what it is you do, and how your work uh, impinges on climate change, and, and what it is you're doing on working on climate solutions? Yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's worth noting that I spent the, for the last 20, 18, 20 years before I went to the Linux Foundation working in politics and government. Um, my last post was at the White House working for President Obama as Deputy White House Press Secretary. And I have, um, I have experienced on the front lines many innovators and regulators and people with all the right intentions who may not have access to, or may not know about all of these emerging tools and technology that can help solve some of these bigger problems. I always think one of the best things that ever happened to us was that the healthcare website failed because we had to bring in a lot of new blood and new people to kind of shed some light on, on what's actually happening, what the advances are. So post that life, I went on to this emerging tech space and what the Linux Foundation really struck me because what they do is bring technology into a collaborative space, otherwise known as open source technology. And what that means is that about 20 years ago, um, tech companies started coming to grips with the fact that if they didn't share some of their innovative thoughts in, de in developing software that moves their innovation forward, that they would all be stymied. And so it's this really kind of fascinating moment in history where it, some people think of this as sort of one of the, the, if not the largest collaborative sharing effort in innovation that we've really ever seen. And so, you know, your Googles, your, your Alibabas, your Tencents, your Facebooks, they exist today because they've shared technology. Your Samsung phone and my iPhone talk to each other because about 70, 80% of the technology that's in it is just open source shared technology that no one owns. And so it was their way of kind of getting around themselves, getting out of their own way for the sake of innovation. And so if you apply that same standard to the energy sector, there is so much possibility. And there are companies that are already doing and innovating in the open source space. But and what, by innovating, I mean the developers who are literally creating the code, they're not random people necessarily. They're actually working at these tech companies and dedicating time and resources to building this open source code that everyone, and by open source, you literally can go get it yourself, everyone can build off of. And the, the amazing thing about it, too, is that it's self-policing in the sense that if somebody were to add a bug, and try to mess it up, you have a lot of developers that are watching that and saying, hey, there's a problem here. And so it's, it's sort of a fascinating new wave on this. And if you haven't noticed, I mean, Microsoft just spent $7.5 billion a few days ago buying one of the biggest open source tools out there. So it's, it's gaining a lot of traction. And, and in a climate context then, so, so yeah. how can this help with climate change? Excuse me. So the way that it can help with climate change is that there is the supply chain of software development that companies can basically come together, form a coalition, preferably if you want to, under the Linux Foundation umbrella, but there are other avenues for that where they work together and they actually create technology and open source coding that they can be using together to deal with some of the, the ways that you're tracking carbon credits, the way that you are dealing with water resources, the way uh, emissions, 
tagging all the emissions and, and what people are using, whether you're individuals or corporations, there is this technology, I'm sure you've heard the word blockchain, but um, it's important to note that that is actually just a ledger of how you're tracking usage of technology. And around the world, maybe not in the US, but in other cities, there's, a, um, there's some issues with transparency and corruption in the ledger and who's using what and fighting going on about what kind of energy usage one city is using and blaming the other for. Right. So, I mean, so, uh, as you say, we hear a lot about blockchain. Yeah. Um, I'm <laughs> tempted to think that every time I hear the word blockchain, I reach my revolver. But right. if, um, It'll I mean, solve you think, every is, problem is there some, on Earth. Exactly. It solves every problem on Earth. Yeah. But I mean, just to, to dig into that a little bit, yeah. how could blockchain really make a constructive contribution? And again, is this something which yeah. is sort of like a possibly maybe, wouldn't it be great if idea, or is this something which is so actually happening? So the reason that blockchain is interesting, and, and really the fundamental reason, is because we live our, the world is functioning on ledgers and sharing technology and, for, and information, and some of those storages of data are easily corruptible. And so what the blockchain technology idea is, is that it's just more secure, and it makes it harder to fudge the ledger. And so that matters if you are tracking any sort of natural resource or any sort of emission, especially if you know, some of the universal bodies out there are keeping, trying to ke hold you accountable for that. So you know, if you're China and you're emitting the X amount of fossil fuel <laughs> into, the, into the atmosphere and you want to change the ledger, not suggesting that they do that necessarily, but if you wanted to, then it's, how can we make that harder, right? And so those things, these are, these are tools in our, in our collective toolbox that are emerging, and these are the kinds of things that energy companies can come together and actually build open source technology together, particularly in the blockchain space, particularly in the blockchain AI space. And this emerging suite of technologies are all going to be really critical as we try to solve these bigger problems. And as I say, is this, is this something which actually is starting to have practical application now, or is it kind of... Absolutely. I, Australia is a huge leader. Um, there's something called Power Ledger out there that basically, if you're, this is more individual based, but I think that there's a B2B component too. But there's a certain amount of credits that you can use. If you want, if you go over, you can, or you, or you don't use as much, you can get credits back. And so keeping these lists and these ledgers of all of it matters a lot. I, I, um, I actually co chair the World Economic Forum's Council on Blockchain with the former president of Estonia. There's tons of, of use cases there from tracking. Um, natural resources or, or mining resources like diamonds, particularly. I mean, there, there, there's no end to how people are, are using this um, for all of, for as many use cases as is possible. But it's early. It's definitely early. And again, what you do is is philanthropic. Then it, it's all in kind of in the non. Profit sphere, huh? Right. So the Linux but, Foundation is funded by about 900 tech companies. And mm. if you look at the list, you've heard of every single one of them. And the reason they do that is because they need a home for this innovation to happen. And so we are sort of this, this wonderful home for all of these developers to work on projects ranging from AI to quantum to blockchain to the Linux Foundation. Was, Linux is the first thing. It actually drives the internet. So that was the first code that continues to build. But there are endless amounts of projects happening under that umbrella. I know, well, thanks. And I wonder if I can bring in the other panelists on, that, on this then, which is the extent to which um, this kind of decarbonization has to be a non-profit endeavor, or can it actually be done by commercial companies seeking to make uh, uh, returns for their investors and seeking to, to, to maximize profits? I, I mean, Jenny, you, a thought on this? I mean, is there something where, are there genuine kind of commercial business opportunities in decarbonization? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, absolutely, there's profits to be made in this. But I think one of the elements to remember is um, the value at every step of that supply chain to having sustainable practices and projects. So you think about um, contractors. We do a commercial construction index. We survey with the US Chamber of Commerce uh, 200 commercial contractors each quarter. Uh, we just released our latest quarterly index. And what we hear is the value to contractors in having the opportunity to specify and use sustainable products, that they are seeing a greater percentage of projects where the building owners are demanding it, particularly led by government and municipalities. So we see more of it in the West, less of it, but, but still increasing amounts across the country. And this is, I think, a key role that governments have, is you take the specifications that have been tested by UL and the standards that are out there, 
you have them signed up to hit Ed's goals, and then it requires manufacturers to get out there and actually provide products, and we can do it in a way that we get a return on the investment for the patents that we've issued and the, and the new processes and the different ways of manufacturing, but at the same time, it's in demand. Um, now, there is a challenge. You can't charge too much because, like I said earlier, construction is a low-margin business, and contractors would also say, even when it's specified, the times that they swap it out, it's for a lower-cost product, not for a... They, they view the quality as equal or better, but they view the cost as something that we still have to be very mindful of to make sure that we're not uh, piling on uh, financially you know, on their burden as well. So, but there is room for everybody to make money in this. Right, and, and as you say, but, but a lot of that then is set though by governments, by uh, national governments, regional governments, state governments, city governments, which are then setting an environment, setting a framework in which, which creates a business case basically. I mean, that's the... Yeah, yeah. And, and interestingly, and, you know, Ed talked a little bit about what's going on around the world. You know, most of those codes are local. And most of the challenges on their codes, and I may toss it to Ed, in many of these countries are local. And that's something that I think overall we have to figure out how to overcome. That when um, a government entity sets a standard that they're actually held accountable, that the builders, the contractors, the people financing, you know, back to how do you use blockchain to prove that they're holding up to those standards. Mm -hmm. Because I will tell you, nothing makes me more angry than to see a building catch on fire because they didn't follow codes, or to see a building collapse because they didn't follow codes, or to see a natural disaster where a building had much greater damage than it should have had because they didn't follow codes. It is a real problem around the world. Okay. I would maybe bring you in on this in terms of the, um, the business case and the commercial opportunities in decarbonization. Do you see big opportunities there? And if so, what are they? Yeah, the, the, uh, what's interesting now is that when you say um, uh, a zero code or zero, zero net emissions code, uh, it's finite. It's done and it's the end game. It's not 10% better, 20% better, moving the needle here, moving the needle there. It, it's it's uh, done and it's universal, and if you get a universal definition out there of what that is, then it's fixed, and everyone can then begin to adhere to it. Um, the confusion has always been the de the the definition of zero net energy, which is um, what's what kind of everyone thinks about, and that is a building. Uh, the definition of zero net energy is a building that produces um, enough energy on site, all its own energy, to offset any energy that it imports. So it puts energy into the grid, clean energy, and pulls energy off the grid, and the grid is actually the storage medium. Um, very few, if you think about what we just uh, talked about, that um, uh, almost all new construction is going to be in urban areas, in dense urban areas, uh, that um, uh, urban population uh, is going to double while rural population is actually going down uh, over the next uh, 30 years. Uh, so all the construction is in dense urban areas. Uh, you're going to see a lot more high-rise buildings, buildings packed in uh, together. Uh, they can't produce all their energy on site. There's just no space. Uh, or the high-rise buildings, they have a very small roof area, how do you do that? Um, so in that case, you can't do zero net energy. And so zero net energy applies to very, very few buildings. Uh, and so to use that definition and keep pushing that definition uh, is not gonna get us anywhere. So we've tried to move the entire industry now and the whole thinking throughout the world to zero net carbon, uh, which then means you produce what you can on site and then import and then buy the rest or import the rest. And that's where things like data and, and blockchain uh, uh, come into play because then you can account for that energy going specifically for your building and not being double counted. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I buy into a system that's off site, I wanna make sure that I'm getting the credit for that and that somebody else isn't siphoning off that credit and is being used for 20 different projects. Um, uh, so, so all that is beginning now to happen and come together with this new definition of on-site plus off-site or just off-site 
um, for getting to zero net carbon. And the codes now, again, the zero code, the first zero net carbon building code is um, uh, you know, three or four weeks old. And it takes time for cities to adopt the code legislation. You need legislation, things like that. Uh, but that's all, now with the code finally settled, that's now going to be the play. Mm. And, um, and we're going to see tremendous movement uh, very quickly. I wanted to pick up on a couple of points um, that, that Jenny was raising as well about um, sort of differences around the world and difference in codes and standards according to where you go. Is this one of the areas where the rich countries are essentially much further advanced then than, than low-income countries? Is it, is it where, I, mean, yeah, well, I, was, I was wondering what you thought of this, but I'd be interested in other people's views as well, but, but what's, what's your sense of it? Yeah, the, the um, um, you, you know, and I showed this uh, yesterday, if you take a dividing, if you divide the world into global north and global south and you use a line to divide that and, um, it essentially runs right through the middle of the Mediterranean so that all Europe is uh, in the global north and Africa and India are in the global south and it runs through, actually runs through around uh, 36 degrees north latitude. So you have the southern US states are in the global south. Um, if you see where all the codes are, um, almost all the mandatory codes in the world are in the global north. And if you, look at, uh, um, if you look at the Global South, uh, I would say probably 80% of the countries in the Global South don't, don't even have a building code, uh, building energy code standard. Uh, and then if you overlay on that, which I did, where all the construction is going to happen between now and 2030 and then 2030 and 2050, it's almost all in the Global South. So now you have all the construction taking place where there's no codes in place. So what's critical at this particular point is to is first to develop an international zero code standard that's adaptable anywhere and that's simple enough to apply to get that in place and then um, to begin uh, education process, training so that, um, so that the codes are, are actually enforced. So that's going to be critical. So, so again, back, back to what we said about um, huge opportunity and also a, a huge challenge then in, in spreading exactly. some of these things around the world. I'm sure. Yeah, and, and I'm going to chime in and I'll give Bill and the UL gang a real plug on this, but I think even getting cities and, and municipalities and countries used to codes on basic blocking and tackling. You know, we had the first fire rated product, uh, wallboard product, in the Middle East, and UL worked long and hard by our side to help us get that certified about four or five years ago. Um, getting that mindset and that mentality that even the basic blocking and tackling for codes needs to be followed, I think then really sets the stage you know, for the much more advanced thinking that Ed's describing. Yeah. And there is a, a long way to go in some of these countries yeah. on that. Uh, what I just throw what open, <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I just want to throw it open to the, to the floor for questions, but sorry, were you going to make a quick point? I was just going to say, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's yeah. amazing how sometimes the simple things make the biggest difference and we ignore them. We really should be doing those first, and that builds to these other things very quickly. Sorry, Jamie, you'll so, The only thing that I would add on the positive side here is that what I've found in, in all tech innovation as a, as a general rule, I mean, it's, it, there's obviously exceptions, is that the developed world is obviously more sophisticated in setting standards and codes, and that's a great thing. But they also, as a result, can get a little bit stuck in, in certain ways. And the developing world, it's, it's a little bit more of a leapfrog opportunity. There are, there are opportunities for countries to say, look, if you can incentivize us financially or through X, Y, and Z government engagement, we could adopt a code right here. We don't have anything that, that's historically we're wedded to, right? And so you can kind of bring, bring countries who have an interest into, into that fold, I think, a little bit quicker. Though it certainly doesn't help that, you know, the President of the United States isn't even staying for the G7 energy discussion <laughs> or environment discussion, so. Indeed. Right, well, I want to uh, open it up for questions now. If anyone's got anything they'd like to ask, if you want to raise your hand, we've got mics which are coming around the room. If you could wait until the mic gets to you. Can anyone? Yeah, we have one here down the front. If uh, someone's able to, yeah, thank you. 
Thanks. Hi, my name is Lucy from Water in Sydney, Australia. Have you explored the adaptability of your new code, zero net carbon code, for precincts rather than just for buildings? Because, in fact, precincts are highly relevant in terms of their carbon intensity or carbon emissions, as just as buildings are, you know, public spaces, and there's potential for offsetting uh, emissions in public spaces and using some public spaces the approach to park, car parking in precincts, etc. Have you given some thought to the applicability of it to a Adaptability wider approach for precincts? Yeah. Interesting question. Thank you, Edward. You yeah. want for you? Um, uh, Adapting the codes for precincts rather than buildings for 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 areas. I, th I think um, what has to happen is a a building code standard is a standard for um, uh, various building types within um, uh, within different climate uh, climate zones. So an international code standard, for example. Um, is a standard for commercial buildings, office buildings, hospitals, uh, you name it. And um, it's, it's international because it would apply to any city, anywhere, any district, anywhere in the world. So you have then districts or jurisdictions that have to adopt the code for that entire jurisdiction. So it's not on a building by building basis, it's a jurisdiction like New York City uh, is a home rule state and it's, it adopts its own code so it can adopt the zero code for the entire city. Um, there are district movements like 2030 districts and things like that that set their own targets um, and some districts then can use the code uh, for all the, all the buildings in their district. USGBC for certification is looking at a zero net carbon certification uh, as well as um, uh, 10 other GBCs all around the world. So they actually certify and they're looking at the code as a way to meet the certification. Uh, so the code uh, can be plugged in in lots and lots of, of different situations from, uh, from cities and countries all the way down to districts and, uh, uh, and NGOs doing certification systems or for profit. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Um, want to, yeah, we have a question over there, if you want to bring the mic down. Oh, muffled. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Hamida, I'm from Egypt, and I'm part of the student delegate for the conference. Um, I had a question about uh, sustainable or um, innovative product design. Um, Jenny mentioned it um, as kind of a like a step forward for uh, building product. And I was also wondering um, if there is or um, if there should be like a policy for sustainable product design in general because we're a very consumer-based society and it would definitely help for waste management. Mm -hmm. So, Thanks. Uh, I, I, let me just repeat your question. You're, you want to know if there should be policies in general for sustainable product design. Yep. What is happening? Yeah. So I think what happens is as, you know, the codes that Ed describes and the um, standards that Bill describes are put forth out there, um, it becomes incumbent upon manufacturers to be very creative in thinking about how we contribute our piece of it um, to that overall building code. And that's why it, you know, it was interesting to us back in the Architecture 2030 Challenge a decade ago to say, do we really believe that we've got the wherewithal to come up with a product that could help contribute to these standards? It's one small you know, drop in the bucket of a total building, but it's important. And, and I think that the more manufacturers that, that really take it very seriously that this is attainable, um, that they have a role in having their materials contribute to the overall footprint, that it's not just the way the pieces are put together, but it's actually the way that those products are manufactured can also contribute to the sustainability. So I don't, I'm not aware of any policies other than just voluntary compliance or having a, a strong corporate perspective. I will say one element that if you're a US public company where you get a lot of pressure on this is the large institutional investors. 
Um, Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock, uh, sent a letter to every CEO in the country that his company invests in, and I believe that they invest in most of the top thousand publicly traded companies. So I got that letter on my desk, and the letter basically said that we're going to, that they as an investor are going to start judging corporations on their commitment to sustainability. And you see it across many other institutional investors, not just BlackRock, where they actually have employees now focused on um, the corporate governance and the corporate approach to sustainability. So I'm not sure if we're going to get the pressure so much from policies, but we certainly are going to get the pressure from investors. And they can exert a lot of pressure. Yeah. So, sorry, Bill, I just wanted to bring Bill in yeah. on it, because I, obviously hugely important for waste. When you're thinking about the end of a product's life, the time to start is at the beginning of the product's life when, when you design it. Is this something that you think is, has right. a role? So a lot of the standards we work on, you know, a standard, something you have to meet, you get a label, but they're really design documents. This really gives you guidance on how to design a product to be more sustainable, and it includes the full life cycle. It includes the manufacturing. It includes uh, the materials that go into it. It includes the end of life in a good standard. So, you know, we talk about the business case for using those documents. It's if you don't have a corporate actor that's interested, mm -hmm. it ends up being purchasing pressure. You know, are the architects, are the construction managers going to specify and use the products that have the sustainable attributes to them. That's going to help drive it as much as anything else. Yeah. Edward, you had a thought? Yeah, and then just the last, uh, last thing. Uh, cities and states uh, have a, a huge amount of clout when it comes to uh, materials because they do a lot of building. They build infrastructure um, and um, uh, they have their own buildings. There are a lot of municipal buildings and city buildings. Uh, that they build out, school buildings, and they fund uh, uh, lots of buildings. So they have a huge say in, in what gets built. We're starting to see now in California policies that the state is putting forward on procurement, on, what, uh, on buying low emissions um, materials and mandating that. And we're, I think, going to see that more and more where cities get involved and say, here's a spec for... Uh, any kind of steel or concrete or whatever gypsum board uh, that we use, here's a spec and um, you either meet the spec or you don't get to play and, uh, or, or, or we don't buy that product. So you either meet the spec or we buy the product. So cities, uh, be, because that's where all the construction is going to happen, um, now have another uh, tool in their toolbox and their kit uh, of policies to, uh, to affect change. Can I just make one point? Yeah, I just want to double down on what Bill said, which is that the low-hanging fruit, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what, what shocks me is not an expert in this space, but, a, but somebody who has spent a lot of time in the sort of problem-solving arena, or at least trying to address it, is why, how, I, I just, what I wish is that there was more attempts to just achieve the low-hanging fruit, the, the why can't we all just do these particular standards? And, you know, while there is a dearth of leadership at the global level in certain areas, cities, and I know this has been a theme throughout the whole conference, but cities right now are really primed to set the example, to say, here are the top 10 things that everyone could do tomorrow that require no additional legislation, that require basically just doing the bare minimum, and what would that do? How would that change things? And those are the kinds of things that I think, um, you know, particularly in my world, if, if, if people could just agree to come together and work on digitizing some of this in a way that is open and shared and frankly saves companies a whole lot of money and incentivizes them, those would be some of the low-hanging fruit that we think are really possible like today, yesterday. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. That, that's a great thought to end on. And unfortunately, <laughs> we do have to end it there. Apologies to anyone. I'm sorry I didn't get to your question. Sorry, apologies. I'm afraid we are now out of time, but it's been a fantastic discussion. We could have gone on a lot longer, and hopefully there will be plenty more opportunities to continue this discussion, possibly over a coffee outside. But for now, uh, Bill Hoffman, Jenny Scanlon, Edward Mazaria, Jamie Smith, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.